Deification of the Planets The Sun and the Moon are two great luminaries, and it is easily understandable that the imagination of the peoples should be preoccupied with them and should ascribe to them mythological deeds. Yet the ancient mythologies of the Chaldeans, the Greeks, the Romans, the Hindus, the Mayans, preoccupy themselves not with the sun or the moon, but prima facie with the planets. Marduk, the great god of the Babylonians, was the planet Jupiter. So was Amon of the Egyptians, Zeus of the Greeks, and Jupiter of the Romans. It was much superior to Shamash, Helios, the sun. Why was it revered by all peoples? Why was the planet Mars chosen to be the personification of the god of war? Why did Kronos of the Greeks, Saturn of the Romans, play a part in hundreds of myths and legends? Thoth of the Egyptians, Nebo and Nergal of the Babylonians, Mithra and Mazda of the Persians, Vishnu and Shiva of the Hindus, Batsi Palazzi and Quetzalcoatl of the Mexicans were a personification of planets innumerable hymns were dedicated to them and adventures and exploits ascribed to them. The life of our planet has its real source in the sun, wrote E. Renan. All force is a transformation of the sun. Before religion had gone so far as to proclaim that God must be placed in the absolute and the ideal, that is to say outside of the world. One cult only was reasonable and scientific, and that was the cult of the sun. But the sun was subordinate to the planets, even though they are not conspicuous, poor sources of light, and no sources of warmth. The night sky illuminated by stars is majestic. The geometrical figures of the constellations such as Pallades, Orion, the Great Bear, rolling from east in the evening to west before morning, our favorite motifs in poetry, no less than the sun and the moon, but the discrepancy in the choice of motifs by the ancients becomes still more obvious. The constellations of the sky took only a minor and incidental part in the mythology of the ancient peoples. The planets were the major gods, and they rule the universe. It is not easy to understand the idea, which was the basis for the identification of the Babylonian gods with the planets, writes an author. But the same process of identification of major gods with the planets can be found in the religions of the peoples in all parts of the world. The planets were not affiliated to the gods or symbols of the gods. They were the gods. In prayers and liturgies, they were invoked as gods. The greater gods, even when addressed by the name in prayer, were regarded as astral powers. This or that planet is selected. According to the text of the prayer, from the multitude of the stars of heaven, to receive a gift, the planetary gods are much the most powerful of all. Their positions in the sky, their reciprocal relations, have a decisive influence on all physical and moral phenomena of the world. The great majority of us moderns pay no attention to these points in the night sky, and probably not one in ten or even in a hundred is able to point to Jupiter or Mars in the firmament. The planets change their places but not conspicuously. Were they indebted for their deification to this slow movement by which they differ from the fixed stars? Did Zeus, Jupiter, Marduk, Amon become the supreme deity, the thunderer and dreadful lord of the universe, only because of his slow movement? He passes in twelve years the cycle of the zodiac, traversed by the sun in 24 hours, and by the moon even quicker. When seen with the naked eye, the planet Jupiter distinguishes itself from the fixed stars of first magnitude only, 
by this slow change of position. Augustine, confused by the problem of the deification of the planets, wrote in the 4th century, but possibly these stars which have been called by their names are these gods. They call a certain star Mercury, and likewise a certain other star Mars, but among those stars which are called by the name of gods is that one which they call Jupiter, and yet with them Jupiter is the world. There also is that one they call Saturn, and yet they give him no small property beside, namely all seeds. Mercury, the closest to the sun, is barely visible, being hidden in the sun's rays. But the ancients made the planet Mercury into a great god, Hermes, or Nebo. Why was it feared and worshipped? What is there generally in the planets to inspire awe? so as to influence people to build temples for them, to sing liturgies, to bring sacrifices, to narrate legends, and to dedicate to them the domain of science, of war, of agriculture. The key to this problem, which is the major problem of all classical mythology, is already in our hands. The planet Venus was deified because of its dramatic appearance and because of the havoc it brought to the world, as described in The Worlds in Collision. I illuminated also the events which made Mars a feared god. Divine qualities were ascribed to the other planets because of the catastrophes they wrought in earlier ages. In the Persian holy books, it is said that on the planets depends the existence or non-existence of the world. Wherefore, are they especially to be venerated? The seven planets rule the universe, says a Nabataean inscription. The Greeks and Romans believe that everything is in fact subject to the changes brought about by the revolutions of the stars. The celestial orbs, by their combined movements, are the authors of all that was and is and is to come. According to ancient Hebrew traditions, there are seven archangels, each of whom is associated with a planet. The seven archangels were believed to play an important part in the universal order through their associations with the planets. The reason for the deification of the planets lay in the fact that the planets, only a short time ago, were not faultlessly circling celestial bodies, nor were they harmless. This is also expressed in a Mandian text. How cruel are the planets to stay there and conspire evil in their rage. The planets conspire in rage against us. Among the Persians, see the... The Dabistan. The Dabistan. Babylonian Magic and Sorcery, London, 1896. L.W. King. I'd like to get a hold of that book. Ah, eh, maybe not. I don't know. The City of God, 1907 by M. Dodds. This was the teaching of Anaxagoras, as reported Diogenes. The deification of the planets is advocated in the Platonic Eponymus 471. The origin of belief among the Greeks in the divinity of the heavenly bodies. Harvard, 1940. Symbolism, astronomy, mystique, Jewish magic and superstition. New York, 1939. And uh, that's about it. In case you were wondering about the deification of the planets, there it is. 
You know, all I think is that the evidence is there on the surface of the planets, on their tilts and axes, and the myths. Put them together and some kind of Saturn theory indeed took place. Saturn was called the god of seeds, or of sowing, also the lord of field fruits. A deluge destroying much faunal life must have caused a dissemination of plants. In many places, new forms of vegetation must have sprouted from the rich soil fertilized by lava and mud. Seeds were carried from all parts of the globe and in many instances, because of the change in climate, they were able to grow in new surroundings. The axis of the Earth was displaced, the orbit changed, the speed of rotation altered, the conditions of irrigation became different, the composition of the atmosphere was not the same. Entirely new conditions of growth prevailed. Ovid thus describes the exuberant growth of vegetation following the flood. After the old moisture remaining from the flood had grown warm from the rays of the sun, the slime of the wet marshes swelled with heat, and the fertile seeds of life nourished in that life-giving soil, as in a mother's womb grew, and in time took on some special form. When, therefore, the earth covered with mud from the recent flood became heated up by the hot and genial rays of the sun. She brought forth innumerable forms of life, in part of ancient shapes, and in part creatures new and strange. The innumerable new forms of life in the animal and plant kingdoms. Following the deluge could have been solely a result of multiple mutations. Although this seems a sufficient explanation of why and how Saturn came to be credited with the work of dissemination and mutation, the mention of another possibly should not be omitted. If it is true that the Earth passed through the gases exploded from Saturn, it should not be entirely excluded that germs were carried together with meteorites and gases and thus reached the Earth. The scholarly world in recent years has occupied itself with the idea that microorganisms, living cells or spores, can reach the Earth from interstellar spaces. Carried along by the pressure of light rays, the explosion of a planet is a more likely method of carrying seeds and spores through interplanetary spaces. The new forms of life could be the result of mutations, a subject I have discussed in Earth and Abuse, but the possibility that seeds were carried away from an exploding planet cannot be dismissed either. Saturn was credited with the introduction of agriculture in Italy. In Greece, Kronos was closely associated with the harvest of grain. Among the Egyptians, it was said that Osiris is seeds. In Babylonia, during the festival marking the drowning of Tammuz, grains and plants were thrown upon the waves. The effects of nearby supernovae on the biospheres have been the object of intensive study by a geologist in recent years. In an attempt to account for abrupt changes in the history of life on this planet, C.D. Russell and W. Tucker, Supernova and the Extinction of the Dinosaurs, Nature, February 19, 1971. Sudden extinctions were followed by the appearance of new species, quite different from those preceding them in the stratigraphic record. In a relatively brief interval, whole genera were annihilated, giving way to new creatures of radically different aspect, having little in common with the forms they replaced. N.D. Newell, Revolution in the History of Life, Geological Society of America, Special Papers, Punctuated Equilibria, The Tempo and Mode of Evolution Reconsidered, 1977. Thus, over the past two to three decades, Many geologists and paleontologists have found themselves increasingly drawn to the view that the observed abrupt changes in the biosphere, such as that which marked the end, the Mesozoic, and is thought to have brought 
with the extinction of the dinosaurs, among other animal groups, could best be explained by the exposure of then living organisms to massive doses of radiation coming from a nearby supernova. The radiation would annihilate many species, especially those whose representatives, whether because of their large size or for other reasons, were unable to shield themselves from the powerful rays. At the same time, new organisms would be created through mutations and macroevolution. See Velikovsky's comments in The Pitfalls of Radiocarbon Dating. In the catastrophe of the deluge, which I ascribe to Saturn exploding as a nova, the cosmic rays must have been very abundant to cause massive mutations among all species of life. Animals would suffer much more severely than plants. On plants, the principal effective would be mutagenic. See K.D. Terry and W.H. Tucker, Biologic Effects of Supernovae, 1968. Fred Hoyle, Does Epidemic Disease Come from Outer Space? 17th November, 1977. It was Velikovsky's claim that only a few thousand years ago, a period of chaos reigned in the solar system. One of the planets closely associated with Earth was Saturn, and watery filaments rained on our planet following Saturn's violent flare-up. Decades later, based on the respective research of Dave Talbot and Eduardo Cardona, Thornhill developed his own model of a primordially close relationship between Earth and Saturn which was the source of all the water in our oceans, while leaving remnants in its rings. Today, Thornhill continues his presentation, shifting his focus to his own successful predictions for the Saturnian system, including the mysterious moon Titan. Before I tell the epic story, a warning. Our education systems train students to memorize a litany of facts, which produces global groupthink. Students are not given the time or encouragement to critically examine the history of ideas. A leading researcher into the learning functions of the divided brain, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, has shown such blinkered left hemisphere training renders students functionally blind to alternative ways of looking at a problem. The left hemisphere simply blocks out everything that doesn't fit with its take. It doesn't see it, actually, at all. So scientists with their narrow specialised training may look at but cannot see what to a non-expert may seem obvious. They will be the last to see a paradigm shift in the making. This is particularly evident for electrical phenomena in space. Even the Nobel Prize winning founder of the idea of an electric universe, Hans Ophain, was ignored when he warned in his 1970 acceptance speech of an inevitable crisis in astrophysics if electric circuits in space are not recognised. Houston, we still have that problem after almost 50 years. I have lived since a teenager with uncertainty about accepted truths and learned to have the courage to challenge them. The result is not chaos, but a synthesis of ideas that explains the old ideas better and finds new ways of incorporating what seems a chaos of anomalies. And the best test is that of classical physics. Simplification. The resulting paradigm shift is not a threat, but an invitation to the greatest adventure we may ever know. 
to begin to understand our real place in the universe for the first time. In our electric universe, stars and planets are formed at the same time inside molecular clouds, along a snaking cosmic lightning bolt. Gravity plays no role in the process. Since cosmic lightning takes the form of a twisted pair of current filaments, it is found that most stars are in pairs, or multiples. Planets will tend to do the same. Like the snaking filaments in a novelty plasma ball, the star-forming filament moves on, leaving a string of massive objects behind to gravitationally form the weird and theoretically challenging zoo of exoplanetary systems recently discovered. Some gas giant planets are subsequently formed in close orbits about a star that has ejected charged matter to achieve stability with a changed electrical environment. The ejection flares may account for the flickering of newborn stars, which can't be explained by gravitational accretion. This explains the unexpected hot Jupiter seen in large numbers closely orbiting other stars. The most numerous stars in the galaxy, brown dwarfs, which would appear reddish if they could be seen with the naked eye, are generally classed as failed stars, yet they have the baffling ability to produce massive stellar flares. This is simply explained because red stars don't have the ability of main sequence bright stars to control their current by a transistor-like action in their photospheric plasma. A brown dwarf can only respond by discharging matter electrically. The capture process of a brown dwarf star involves flaring and ejection of charged matter by that body in order to achieve a new electrical equilibrium in its adopted family. That accounts for the large number of close orbiting moons of our captured gas giants in remote orbits. With this in mind, I want to take you back to just before the famous Cassini-Huygens space probe was to arrive at Saturn on July the 1st, 2004. In news reports, Saturn was dubbed the original Lord of the Rings. There is a profound truth behind such a glib turn of phrase, but it wasn't until the advent of the telescope that Christian Huygens in 1656 was able to suggest that Saturn had a ring. So how do we explain the Saturnian ring symbolism that pervades our cultures? The halo of the saints, the royal crown, and the ring given in marriage are Saturnian symbols, as are the circled or Celtic cross, the Egyptian ansate cross or ankh, the eye of Ra, and the astronomically baffling star inside the crescent. The star at the top of the lighted Christmas tree is pure Saturnian imagery. It is truly amazing that we are still haunted by prehistoric archetypes. It helps us to understand the extraordinary archetypal attraction of Tolkien's fantasy of Lord of the Rings. He was well versed in mythology. The following description of events is based on the surprisingly detailed and truly remarkable scholarship of Talbot and Cardona, which required explanations with the physics of an electric universe. Let's call our primordial star Proto-Saturn. It was an independent brown dwarf with its own entourage of satellites, including the Earth, Mars and Titan. Proto-Saturn's dim reddish light was due to a glowing red anode plasma sheath, much larger than the Sun, enclosing Proto-Saturn and its inner satellites in a radiant cell. The term dwarf star is purely theoretical, since they are difficult to see and measure. In fact, NASA reported a brown dwarf which was radiating as if it had twice the expected surface area. The environment inside the radiant red shell is most hospitable for life on any enclosed satellites because there are no seasons and water is conspicuous in the spectra of such stars. Water misted down on this planet continually and red light is ideal for photosynthesis, which explains the abundance of ferns and other vegetation globally in the Carboniferous era. But there is a catch. Brown dwarf stars are known to flare sometimes to the extent, as one astronomer commented, that any satellites would suffer a very bad day. Such flaring by Proto-Saturn accounts for the geological strata and the fossil record of a number of global mass extinctions and instant burial of dismembered plant and animal remains. As we approach the Sun from deep space, 
Our plasma sheath flickered like a faulty electric light when the two stellar plasma sheaths, or magnetospheres, began to clash. Proto-Saturn's galactic electrical power was usurped by the Sun, and its appearance changed dramatically. Before dimming forever, the dwarf star Proto-Saturn would have flared brilliantly like a comet, ejecting charged matter to relieve the electrical stresses caused by the sudden change in environment. Even now the former star has not completely cooled. Saturn still radiates more than twice the heat it receives from the Sun. And we have a simple explanation for the origin of Saturn's mysteriously short-lived water ice rings. As the proto-Saturnian system approached the Sun in the outer solar system, our minor star's gravitational sphere of influence steadily shrank and its outer satellites were progressively stripped away. This and the earlier capture of the other gas giants provides the source of trans-Neptunian objects as they're known including Pluto with its unexpected geology and atmosphere, and its peculiar moons. There is a simple physical characteristic that links a captured star with its offspring. It is the axial tilt. Like our close orbiting moon, satellites tend to orbit their primary with the same face always turned toward it. If they orbit in the equatorial plane, their spin axis will be aligned with that of the primary. As gyroscopes, the satellites will retain the same tilt even if jolted from their orbit, although the process may induce a wobble of the spin axis. It is therefore highly significant that the two key planets identified in the ancient pantheons, Saturn and Mars, have axial tilts closely similar to that of the Earth. The tilt of Saturn at 27 degrees to the ecliptic plane is itself an enigma, unless it formed independently from the Sun. Venus was described as a spectacular discharging body in the ancient congregation of planets. It can be explained if Venus was ejected in the flare-up of proto-Saturn and the infall of the stream of ejected matter from swiftly rotating proto-Saturn gave Venus a slow retrograde spin. The magnitude of the axial tilt of Venus to the ecliptic is much less than Saturn's, which suggests that Venus was ejected from a low latitude. This accounts for the hellish temperature and new surface of Venus, having been recently spat from the mantle of a brown dwarf star. Its filamentary equatorial scars caused by spectacular radial discharging, and its thick atmosphere inherited from the brown dwarf and subsequently modified by interplanetary and cometary discharges. Venus still has a cometary magnetotail stretching to the Earth's orbit, and its mountaintops glow with plasma discharges, which return Magellan's radar signals as unexplained shininess.